One of the first crises was the Pythagorean result that the square root of two is irrational. And the fact that this was a crisis survives in the word irrational. Remember, the Greeks thought rationality was the supreme goal, right? Plato, reason. So, so the, if a number is called irrational, that means that this was the Gettle incompleteness theorem of, the, of ancient Greece. So there was a crisis there. Another crisis was caused by the calculus. A lot of people said, this is nonsense. We're talking about infinitesimals. What is this? Bishop Barclay and, and that whole question. You know, he, he was a theologian, and he said, pure mathematicians make as little sense as theologians. You can't reject us saying we're unreasonable. Limits, I mean, the whole way you deal with evanescent quantities in the calculus, this was before the calculus had a rigorous foundation, is as bad as our theological discussions. So at that time, it was pretty bad. Then there was a crisis about geometry, right? Uh, Euclidean geometry, the parallel axiom, non-Euclidean geometries. So mathematics is not static and eternal. But this particular crisis I want to tell you about goes back a little more than 100 years to work of Cantor on set theory. Now, Cantor has a... So my whole talk is very impractical, okay? We all know that you can have a startup and in, in, in one year make a million dollars, if you're lucky, in the web. So this is about how not to make any money on the web. This is how to ruin your career by thinking about philosophy instead. So, so Cantor, Cantor liked, was obsessed with the notion of infinite, and it's sort of not mentioned that he was obsessed with infinite because he was interested in theology and God, which is edited out from the accounts now. But, but that was the original idea. And Cantor had the idea that if you have one, two, three, why stop there? So I'm giving you a cartoon version of Cantor's theory of infinite sets. You put a omega. This is a Greek letter. The last low case of the last. Is this the last letter in the in the Greek alphabet? Yes. So that's the reason to pick it. So this you you just say I'm going to put another number here instead of stopping one two three. This is going to be the first number after all the finite numbers. This is the first transfinite number. And then he, you know. You can keep going for a while, and then you have another thing like a copy of 1, 2, 3, omega plus 1, omega plus 2, omega plus 3. These are names. And then, well, you say, why stop here? I'm going to put something after all this. So 2 times omega. 2 times omega plus 1 plus 2 plus 3. Then later, 3 omega, 4 omega. Well, what comes after all of those? Why stop there? Okay, so omega squared, right, obviously. And then you keep going, omega, 5 times omega squared plus 8 times omega plus 96. And then much later, you, go, you get to omega cubed, obviously, right? And then eventually, omega to the fourth. You keep going, and you know why stop there? The sequence goes on forever, but let's put something after all of those. So what would that be? Well, that would be obviously omega to the omega. This is starting to get interesting. Then you keep going, you have omega to the omega to the omega. This is pretty far out number already. You can see why this is becoming theological. It's not, well, this is, this is a mathematical equivalent of drug addiction. Instead of getting high on alcohol or grass, you get high on ideas like this, you know, and you, after a while you don't know where you're standing or what's going on. So then the next number is omega to the omega to the omega to the omega forever, and this number is the solution of the, the smallest solution of the equation x is equal to omega to the x. And it's called epsilon naught. I don't know why. Because you start having problems with how to name things. Because up to here, I was using algebraic, normal algebraic notation, just throwing in omega. So, so anyway, you can see this is fantastic stuff. It's, I don't know whether it's mathematics, but, but it's very imaginative. It's very pretty. And actually, there was a lot of practical spin-off for pure mathematicians from what Cantor was doing. Because... The notion of set theory, some people regard it as a disease. You know, Poincaré, the great French mathematician, said set theory is a disease. He said, from which I hope future generations will recover. But other people redid all of mathematics using the set theoretic approach. So modern topology, in a way, topology in a lot of abstract mathematics of the 20th century is a result of this more abstract approach, set theoretic approach, which generalized questions. The, mathematician, the mathematics of the 19th century was at a lower level in some ways, more looking at special cases and formulas. And the mathematics of the 20th century, in a way, I mean, it's hard to write a history of mathematics from the year 10,000 looking back because we're right here, but the mathematics of the 20th century, you could almost say is set theoretical would be a way to 
describe it. The mathematics of the 19th century was concerned with formulas, you know, infinite Taylor series perhaps. But the mathematics of the 20th century went on to a set theoretic level of abstraction. And in part, that's due to Cantor, and some people hate it, saying Cantor wrecked, ruined mathematics by taking it from being concrete and making it wishy-washy, you know, from hard analysis to abstract analysis. Other people love this. It was very controversial. It was very controversial. And what didn't help, what didn't help is, in fact, that there got to be some contradictions. It, wasn't, it became more than just a matter of, of opinion. There were some cases in which you got into really bad trouble. You got uh, obviously obvious nonsense out. And the place you get obvious nonsense out, in fact, is a theorem of Cantor's that says, for any infinite set, there's a larger infinite set, which is the set of all subsets which sounds pretty reasonable. This is Cantor's diagonal argument. I, I'm not, I don't have time to give you the details. So then the problem is, what happens if you, so if you believe that for any infinite set, there's a set that is even larger, what happens if you apply this to the universal set, the set of everything? The problem is, by definition, the set of everything has everything. And this method supposedly would give you a larger set, which is the set of all subsets of everything. So there's got to be a problem. And the problem was noticed by Bertrand Russell Cantor, I think, may have noticed it, but Bertrand Russell um, went around telling everyone about it, <laughs> giving the bad news to everyone. So, 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 so at least Gödel attributes to Russell the recognition that there was a serious crisis. So, so the crisis in, in this proof of Cantor's that Russell noticed was, well, it's the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. It turns out to be the key step in the proof. And the set of all sets that aren't members of themselves sounds like a reasonable way to define a set, but if you ask if it's, if it's inside itself or not, whatever you assume, you get the opposite. It's a contradiction. It's like saying this statement is false. The set of all sets that are not members of themselves is contained in itself if and only if not contained in itself. So, so that means that some ways of defining sets are good and some are bad, or the universal set gets you into trouble. What's wrong with the set of everything? Okay, so, so there was a problem that with set theory, it became increasingly clear, and I think Russell helped to make this be recognized by everybody, that we had a serious crisis and that methods of reasoning that seemed at first sight perfectly legitimate in some cases led to obvious contradictions. And there were a whole bunch of paradoxes that Russell advertised, the Berry paradox, uh, the one I just mentioned is called the Russell paradox, um, there's another paradox, Borali Forti paradox. A lot of these paradoxes, in fact, were really brought to the attention of the world by Russell. Russell would typically have a footnote saying, you know, um, this paradox occurred to me while I was reading a paper by Borali Forti. So everyone calls it the Borali Forti paradox. Borali Forti, I think, spent his whole life trying to live down this attribution because he didn't believe that mathematics was in trouble. Okay, so, so there was a crisis, and I think Russell was one of the key figures in this. So at this point, David Hilbert comes to the rescue. David Hilbert was a very important mathematician around the turn of the century who, unlike Poincaré, a very important French mathematician, David Hilbert was a very important German mathematician, and Hilbert liked set theory. He liked this abstract Cantorian approach. And Hilbert, what Hilbert set up, what was the idea of, uh, how do you say, it, it was the idea of solving once and for all these problems. And how was he going to do it? Um, well, he was going to do it, Hilbert. The way Hilbert was going to do it is the axiomatic method. 